All right, would you open your Bibles with me? Thank you, team. I appreciate you guys so much. They always do a tremendous job. That's right. Come on, let them hear it. They do a great job. I've been preaching a series entitled Stepping Into Your Miracle. Last week I preached, Whose Face Do You See? My text was Hebrews eleven twenty seven, 27, and it was talking about Moses, and it says, By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger, but he persevered. What did Moses persevere? He persevered with three million people grumpy in the middle of the desert. He persevered that even though they had lack of education, he believed God to be their sustenance in every way. They lived in the middle of the desert, and they didn't have natural resources, but every morning, God fed them with something better than Kellogg's cornflakes. Every morning, he served them breakfast, the same food that angels eat. That's what the Bible says. Manna from heaven is food that angels eat. He fed them every morning. In the middle of a desert, he gave them shade during the day, and he gave them warmth during the cold desert nights. The Bible also says that every evening he brought them fresh meat. Quail. Quail, they say, is uh, one of the exotic foods of kings. You could live in natural circumstances that are like a desert, But God says that he will prepare a banquet table for us, even in the face of our enemies. And here they were, Moses persevered. He saw quail on his table every evening. Fresh kill, fresh meat, fresh delicacies. Morning and evening, he saw the resources of God. It says their sandals never wore out. It says that if they got bit by a snake, anyone who looked onto Moses' staff with faith was instantly healed. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. And the great truth of this verse is not that Moses persevered, but it's that he saw him who is invisible. And I want to tell you, while ever we keep seeing the one who is invisible, we will always do the impossible. I want to take you today to Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 22. My sermon title, if I give you the abbreviated form, is, is the wind in your face is the wind in your face. Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went on up to a mountainside by himself to pray. How many of you think it's good to imitate and do the things Jesus did? Sometimes we've got to get away from the crowd and go and pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves. Natural circumstances were making their encounter impossible. Because the wind was against it, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. The boat was already a considerable distance because the wind was blowing against it, making it impossible for the two to come together. I love this very fact. This one seemingly insignificant detail in the story is a sermon all by itself. And what it tells me and what it preaches to me is that when natural circumstances are separating me from God, God will do the supernatural and override the natural and he's coming to my aid. The wind kept the boat and Jesus apart. 
But God stepped on the water. He defied the natural realm. He employed his supernatural power. He came. The verse goes on to say, <clears throat> verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Verse 27 goes on and tells us, it's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. I want you to stop for a moment and let's make an observation here. They're seeing at first what they believe to be a natural man. Walking on water, that's a supernatural event. Like you and me, they pause and find it implausible for natural men to walk in supernatural ways. And so they go from looking at Jesus to concluding it must be a ghost because only the supernatural overrides the natural. I want you to know there's another sermon here and the sermon is that while we are still the natural sons of God on a natural planet earth, God wants to do supernatural things. They went from seeing it's Jesus to concluding it must be a ghost because he's overriding natural laws. I believe that in the life of the church of Jesus Christ, God wants to override natural laws all the time. If you remember, he sent the disciples out to preach and confirm that the kingdom of heaven is at hand with signs and wonders. If the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell are supernatural, then if they're not going to prevail, God intends for natural men to employ his supernatural ability and power. Isn't it funny? One minute they see Jesus, next minute they see him walking on water, and they conclude it must be a ghost. Because natural men don't override natural order. It goes on and says, But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is me. It's the natural man. Don't be afraid. Verse 28, he goes on. Lord, Peter says, If it really is you... Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. So Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now a second natural man is defying natural order and natural laws. Peter says, if it's really you, tell me to come. And the word of the Lord is, come, it's really me. So Peter gets out of the boat, he walks on the water, he comes towards Jesus, but when he saw the wind, I want you to repeat it with me, but when he saw the wind, Last week, I asked you, whose face do you see? Moses didn't see Pharaoh. He saw God. Here's Peter. The word of the Lord came to him. Do you know the word of the Lord always reveals the will of God? Peter says to God in the flesh, yet very flesh at the moment, he says, Jesus, if it is you, bid me to come. And God in the flesh says, come. Now we have on one hand, Peter has the word of God in his hand. And he starts to walk on the water because he's trusting the word of God he just heard. 
And many of us start out in faith trusting the Word of God. But it was fresh in Peter's ears, come. He didn't have time to savor it. He didn't have time to mull over it. He didn't have time to hide this in his heart. The Word was fresh in his ears, but I dare say it wasn't in his heart. And you say, well, how, do you, how can you say that? What audacity, what, what authority do you have at what, to say it wasn't in his heart? And I'll tell you that he didn't have it in his heart. He had it in his ears because the minute he saw the wind, he was afraid. When the Word of God is hidden in your heart, fear can't easily replace it. You can know the Word. You can hear the Word. You can repeat the Word. But the reality and the truth and the power of that Word, the full implication of that Word needs to be hidden in your heart. And so here's Peter, one minute he's looking at Jesus, talking to Jesus, and it says that he's walking towards him. As he's walking towards him, he's seeing the face of Jesus, but he's feeling the wind in his face. And he looks at the wind, and he looks at the waves, and he starts to sink. Whose face are you looking in? If you look into the face of natural circumstances... You will lose sight of the face of God. Moses persevered in the wilderness because he kept seeing the face of God. He kept seeing the character of God. Miles and miles and miles of nothing but sand blowing in the wind. But he persevered because he saw the face of God. Here's Peter starting to step out in the supernatural. Here's Peter rising up like a son of God. Here's Peter finally acting out the things that Jesus would later say, and that is the things I have done you will do also and greater. Why isn't there a greater cry in the church that rises up and says, How come I'm not seeing greater things than Jesus did? It's a religious spirit that numbs our brains and we just conclude and stifle all questions by concluding, well, he was God in the flesh. The Bible tells me that Jesus Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. The Bible could have said he's just the Son of God come in the flesh, and he was every bit God. He was every bit God. But when he came as a man, he came as the firstborn of many brethren, because he's the pattern of what the sons of God are supposed to look like. That's why he could say, what I've done, you can do also. What I do, you can do also, and greater. That's why when Peter says, if you're walking on the water and it's really you, bid me to come. He says, come. But you will slip from the supernatural to the natural if your mind is on the natural realm. Whose face do you see? Peter saw the face of natural circumstances. Natural circumstances will scream at you. Natural circumstances will get in your face. How many of you know negative things get in your face? We know how to say, don't get in my face. Get out of my face. But we got to know how to say to natural circumstances, get out of my face. Because my face has only got place for one thing, and that is to look on the face of Jesus Christ. If I see and say what the natural is showing, the natural will always be Lord over my circumstance. But if I see and say what the Lord is saying... The supernatural will always be Lord 
over my circumstance. Here's Peter. He's got the word of God under his arm. And one minute he's running. Whoa, brother, am I going to tell the boys about this? Here I am. I'm walking on water. This is great. This is exciting. Come on. You know Peter's personality was impetuous. You know Peter was that kind of a guy. He was an A-type personality, or as we say in the DIS system, he was a D all the way. Here's Peter. The other guys are still in the boat. Man, am I going to tease them? Puff wind in his face and he stops looking at God and he's looking at the face of natural circumstances he starts to sink he cries out Lord save me immediately Jesus reaches out his hand and he caught him and he says you of little faith why did you doubt? You of little faith, why did you doubt? I remember one time back in Australia, I was overseeing 12 churches, had the largest geographical area in the movement, and one of the largest number of churches for an overseer. <clears throat> We put on a conference in our little church. We had over 300 delegates come. That was more people than I had in my church. That was like two times the size of my church at that point. And I got all the cooks in the church, some who were accustomed to catering, and I, we put a menu together and I asked them to cook. And on the day that we were serving all the delegates, Two of the cooks came running out to me as they were serving out the food. And they said, Pastor, look at the line. And look in the pots. We don't have enough food. I took them all, uh, those two, into the kitchen, and I prayed with them. And I said to them, now go up and down the line of service and tell them, Pastor said, don't look in the pots. Keep serving the food and smile. Whose face do you see? If you see the face of natural circumstances, it gets into your head. And by time, the reality of what you saw gets into your head and it comes out of your mouth. You saw it and you said it and you just made the natural circumstance Lord of that situation. Whose face are you looking at? I told them not to look in the pots because I didn't want them to see and say what they were seeing. I wanted them to see the word of the Lord and say the word of the Lord because then the supernatural would be Lord of their circumstances. Amen. You know what happened? I think Juliet remembers this, this situation. You were there. We fed all 300 delegates, and we had food left over. God is able. God is able. You've got to understand something. As an Italian, if I'm going to have you over my house for a meal, the most embarrassing thing to me would be if there's not enough food on the table. If we're down to one little piece of meat, that is an insult. That is an embarrassment because nobody wants to take the last piece of meat. Everybody repeat after me, abundanza. I'll say it again, abundanza. Say it. You know what that means? Abundance. If there isn't an abundance on the table, so that people don't have to think twice about whether or not they take a second or third portion, 
nothing will embarrass me more than not having a, a, enough food on the table. I'll tell you right now, when we have communion Sunday and I ask you all to bring food, I've been caught a couple of times where there wasn't enough food out there. And so I've ordered uh, our workers every, every communion Sunday, we buy about uh, 10 or 20 chickens and they cut up the pieces. And on Sunday morning, when I come here to preach to you, and I'm working on my sermon, I've usually got four half trays of baked ziti or baked lasagna in the oven because I don't want to be embarrassed. Stay with me. God wants you to have more than enough. Here I was as the supervisor over 12 churches 300 delegates in my church. Good morning, Lord. Supervisor of 12 churches and 300 delegates in my church. The worst thing that could happen is me not have enough. And they were paying for the privilege of the food. You know, something as insignificant as that, God was happy to reach into his natural, supernatural resources. I say natural, supernatural resources because it's natural for God to be supernatural. Hello? If I'm going to walk with God, then it's natural to expect supernatural things. We want to believe in a supernatural God, and then everything else about it is all natural. No. God wants to walk with us in a supernatural way. Somebody say amen. amen. Can I very quickly conclude here and just make a couple of observations? It's interesting that Peter says, if it's you, bid me to come. God says, it's me. God was saying, it's my will. Peter had the fresh word of the Lord. It was still in his ears, but it wasn't in his heart. You got to get the word of God in your heart, because when the word of God is in your heart, the wind of the world could be in your face, but it's not going to deter you. Did you hear me? When the word of God is in your heart, the wind of the world could be in your face, but it won't cheat you out of your miracle. Jesus makes two observations. Number one, he says, oh, what little faith. Oh, what little faith. Why did you doubt? Two observations. Peter, you had little faith. And number two, you doubted. What is faith? If he had little faith, what is it? Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is confidence in what we're hoping for. It's the assurance. It's the absolute assurance about what we do not see. Faith will elevate us from the natural realm to the supernatural realm. Watch. Faith is absolute assurance about what we do not see. What I see is the natural. If I can have absolute conviction about what I do not see, faith took me from the natural to the supernatural. The Amplified Bible says it this way, faith is the assurance, the title deed. You got ownership of this thing, man. Emotionally, you took ownership of it. Faith is when emotionally you got the title deed. You have the confirmation of the things you once hoped for. They are divinely guaranteed. It is the evidence of things not seen. I've got the evidence. It is the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Jesus said you only had a little bit of that stuff. Peter, you wavered because you didn't stay convinced of what you could not see. You could not stay convinced of things greater than your physical senses. 
And when we have little faith, the natural circumstances of life will dominate us. Listen to me. You might say, hey, why all the importance on miracles? Miracles happen all the time, and sometimes they come out of the belly of hell. I thank God for doctors. For one minute I could be fine, and the next minute a doctor gives me a verdict. And the minute I come into agreement with his verdict, I've got arthritis for the rest of my life. I've got sickness for the rest of my life. All the medical records proved I had Hashimoto's disease. You know what Hashimoto's disease is? It's a, a, like an arthritis that travels from joint to joint. I was working in my brother's warehouse when I had left Australia, left my ministry position, and I'm lifting boxes out of the big containers, the tractor trailers, and I'm stacking them in aisles in the warehouse. And suddenly, Hashimoto's disease would grip this elbow and I drop a mag wheel. Each wheel was worth several hundred dollars. It would be in my knees. It would travel to my wrist, all different parts. Hashimoto's disease. And I battled with the natural evidence of it for months. Until finally one day, you see, I heard what the doctor said. And I confessed what the doctor said. And when I confessed it, I took ownership. I got the title deed. They did the medical tests. It's in my blood. They showed me it's in my blood. There's the research. I had faith that what he said was right. Until I got angry and I came to my senses and I said, if it's Hashimoto's disease, I'm giving it back to Hashimoto. <laughs> if we see and say after the natural, then what we see and say will be our Lord in the situation. But if I see and say after the supernatural, then what I see and say will be Lord in my situation. Jesus said, Peter, too little of this stuff too little of this. You didn't have enough of that emotional ownership of the fact that you're walking on water. He says, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubt? James chapter 1 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. When you ask, Peter said, can I come? Jesus said, yes. Can I be healed? By his stripes, you're already healed. God, do you want to heal me from Hashimoto's disease? I've gotten to the point I don't even have to ask that question. By his stripes, you are healed. That's the beginning and the end of it. Because that's the beginning and the end of it as far as God's concerned. He says, by his stripes, you're already healed. When you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Jesus said you had little believing and you had too much doubting. Look at James. You must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind and he will not receive anything. Amazing. I read to you what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Faith is this emotional ownership. I've got it. I've got it. It's the title deed. It's the absolute conviction in your heart. When you hear the word of the Lord, when you read the word of the Lord, take God's word and hide it in your heart. If you believe the word of God over natural circumstances, you will see the God of the supernatural override your natural circumstances. In Hebrews 11.2, after it gives the description of faith, you know what it says? And this is what the ancients were commended for. How many of you want to be commended by God? They were commended for this. For what? For having the ability to take God's word 
and refused to succumb to what they saw and what they heard, but to keep running with the Word of God. The wind could be in your face, but the Word of God needs to be in your heart. Yes, amen. Can I get an agreement? Amen. Come on, let's all stand. My worship team will come and join me. you, Jesus. Thank you, Mary. Listen to me. This miracle stuff is important for this reason. Hell is supernatural. Demons come from that supernatural realm. And they come to bring curses to us and they manifest in the natural. A drug addicted son. How do you get enough of God to move heaven and earth and believe for your son to get saved and delivered? An alcoholic problem that you've struggled with. Your daddy was an alcoholic and you see his face in front of your face. You hear the words over and over again, you'll be like your father, you're just like your father. Why is the miraculous important? Because without God's the miraculous intervention, the supernatural of hell will continue to override the affairs of natural men. Jesus Christ said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. He had the keys of hell and death. He wants to come to the handcuffs that hell put on you and put the keys in and go click, click, and let the handcuffs crash to the ground. I believe that the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. And what that means is the church will kick in the gates of hell. The supernatural of God, of Jesus Christ, of the Holy Spirit, is greater in us than the supernatural manifestations of hell that are in this world. I believe God cares about you and He cares about me enough that if there isn't enough food on the table and we're doing our due diligence, give us this day our daily bread. We'll move the hand of heaven to provide food on earth. I believe God wants us to experience that overcoming power that is available in the name of Jesus. Say no. Say no to the wind in your face. Say no to the voice of natural disasters and natural circumstances. Say no to Murphy's Law. Say no to the curse of sin and death. Say no. Sometimes we've got to get to a place where we won't take it anymore and something inside of us breaks and rises up. I got to a point where I decided, well, if it's Hashimoto's disease, let him have it. If it's a curse, let it go back to the one who gave the curse. If it's a curse, hang it on Jesus. He became a curse so that we can be curse free. Expect God's supernatural intervention in your life, whether it's for your marriage, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter. God is not limited. But what good is it if he's limitless? But we never know whether or not he wants to do a miracle in our lives. The advantage of having Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you is your reason to experience the glory of God.
Miracles don't happen because I deserve it. Miracles happen because Jesus Christ came. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. In the natural, doctors speak. And they will bring conclusions. You hide the word of God in your heart. And you say, I don't care what the natural says. I care what the supernatural says. God reigns. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I'm going to have a breakthrough. Don't give up. I'm going to have a breakthrough. I'm going to have a breakthrough. Can I get an agreement? While every eye is closed right now. The number one step to opening the door of miracles is to open your heart to Jesus Christ. And if you have never asked Jesus Christ in your heart, then friend, before you leave this place today and have a great day, the best thing you can do is to ask the Son of God to come into your life. With Him inside of you, miracles can't help but happen. The Bible says we've all sinned. The Bible says we've all made mistakes. The Bible says we're all stubborn, we get rebellious, we do things wrong. Sometimes intentionally and sometimes not intentionally. But the truth is we all sin. But there's only one person who can save us from that puddle of sin. And his name is Jesus Before I close, the pastors are going to start making their way down the front. The pastors and their wives, they're going to be available to pray for you. We're going to close in a moment with a song. And we're going to release you to go or to come out the front and worship. But if you have never asked Jesus Christ in your heart, or you need to get right with God, while every eye remains closed, I want you to be A person of conviction enough to raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. Come on. Say yes to Jesus. Thank you, sir. I see your hand up the back. You can put it down. Who else? Put your hand up and say, I want to accept Jesus Christ. I need Jesus Christ in my heart today. I need. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. You can put it down. God bless you. So proud of you. Come on. Others here need to accept Jesus. I am not going to be afraid about the most powerful thing. I'm not going to be timid about calling people to the one thing that can set them free. And that is a relationship with the Son of God. If there's anyone else, come on, put your hand up right now. I want to pray with you before you leave this place. Any others? Would you quickly turn and quietly turn to somebody next to you? Very respectfully, ask them, do you know Jesus? Those of you that raised your hand, I'm coming down. Come and meet me. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you right now. Come on. Turn around and ask somebody next to you, do you know Christ? Have you accepted Jesus? Come on down. Come with him, Maurice. Come on. Good man. God bless you. Come on. Give him a big hand. Others that raised your hand, come on down. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. I want to pray with you right now. Come on, that's it, sir. Good man. I love it when men say yes to Jesus. It's a manly thing. It's a good thing. You know what Jesus went after? He went after men. Good on you, buddy. Just stand there. Come on, fella. God bless you. I love it. Men, men, men. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. This isn't a girly thing. This isn't an old lady thing. It's something for all of humanity. We were broken. We were lost. But Jesus has come to be the firstborn of many brethren. He has come to set us free. This is awesome. I am so proud of these guys. Let them know how proud you are of them. Awesome, awesome, I mean it. You don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed. Every person that's clapping their hands did exactly what you're doing today. If what I'm saying is true, if you've done what they've done, put your hand up right now. Look at that. Nothing to be ashamed of. The Bible says that we're all broken in one way or another. But God comes for the broken. Here, turn around and face me. 
I want everyone to pray this prayer. I want you guys. What's your name? Kevin. Kevin? Good day, yes, Kevin. God yes, bless, you. bless you. Good man. What's your name? Chuck. Joe? Chuck. Chuck. My middle name is Charles. So I guess I'm Chuck too. <laughs> Good on you, buddy. God bless you. What's your name? J.R. J.R. Okay. I'm R.S. And that doesn't stand for something bad either. Good man. I want you guys to repeat after me. We're going to pray a simple prayer. It's going to sound something like this. God, I believe you're here. I believe you're touching me. Heck, I know I need you. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. I have. I have. So it's no surprise. We all have. Jesus, I need you to come into my heart. I'm going to get the whole church to pray it, but are you happy to pray it, JR? Are you happy to pray it, Chuck? Are you happy to pray it? Yes, Come on, everyone, close your eyes and repeat after me. Guys, repeat after me. God, I know you're here. I sense you. I feel you. Jesus Christ, be real to me. Touch me. I invite you into my life. Come into my life now. Forgive me of all the mistakes. Forgive me for all of my sin. I need your divine presence. I need your life in my life. And Jesus Christ, I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. I receive you. Just as you receive me, I open my spirit to you. Come in. I open my spirit. Come in. Amen. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, you've given me authority in heaven and earth. And over these men right now, you said to be fishers of men. Thank you for men today. Bring us women, children, elderly. Bring us men. But as an authority in the spirit world, I break the powers of darkness over their lives. The unseen ruling forces that manipulate and control. I break them in the name of Jesus Christ. I command everything from hell to back off as I cover these men in the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood sanctifies and sets us free. I rip them out of the kingdom of darkness by this de declaration today. Today, by the blood of Jesus, I thank you, Father. They are coming into your kingdom and into your family. I thank you today. Their sins are forgiven and the power of darkness is broken. I thank you, Spirit of God, that today you come inside of them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.